Arriba! This is WWE legend, Hall of Famer Tito Santana, and you are watching Pro Wrestling Planet. Does not get any better than this. Arriba! Tag team wrestling is really an art form all to itself. Some say the concept was born as early as the 1900s. That means that for over a hundred years now, dudes have been teaming up and trying to cause damage together. So we here at Pro Wrestling Planet present to you the 100 greatest tag teams of all time. The only criteria being is that, well, there really is no criteria. But we did try to stick to continental U.S. promotions. And also, sorry ladies, there are no female tag teams on this list. That's going to be a different list altogether. I mean, the Mulkey Boys just had to be on here as far as I'm concerned. I would say the greatest loser tag team of all time, so... I know some people are gonna balk at this one, but they sold a lot of merchandise and they were super over, which is something that's kind of hard to come by nowadays, if you haven't noticed. A solid team of young guys, you know, really flashy there in the late 80s. Never really won any titles, but whatever, here they are. This team held the Impact Tag Team titles for over 200 days. These guys, I think, were way ahead of their time, and as you can see here, even had a small run as the WWE Tag Team Champions, and this was pre-Attitude Era. I mean, perhaps most of their story is still yet to be written, but there's a huge ceiling for these guys. That's why I think they fit in nicely here in the, in the 90s section. Hey, they took the free bird rule to the absolute limit. Also, were tag team champions for close to a year. Like it or not, they deserve to be on the list. You know, when I first saw the Street Profits, I was just like, oh, Crime Time Reborn. Either way, what up, JTG, and rest in peace, Shad Gaspard. Just the fact that one of the guy's names is Gigolo Jimmy Del Rey, that's admitted onto this list alone. A lot of promise for these guys early on, and I think the window is kind of closing a little bit for them to be true game changers. But to me, they'll always be looked at as a great team, no matter what name they're under, whether it's the War Raiders, War Machine, uh, the Viking Experience. Uh, now I think they've settled back in on the Viking Raiders. But uh, yeah, it is what it is. Did some really good work for a window there. Appear to be split now, but who knows what the future may hold for either one of these guys. Certainly made an impression early on though. Even though they don't have a whole lot on their tag team resume as a whole, when they did team up, oh my gosh, like how scary is that, right? Like definitely the hardcore wrestling dream team. Let's face it, mid-2000s WWE mid-card was pretty much a wasteland for tag teams. The division as a whole during this time and for several years after that was really thought of as an afterthought. Caden Murdoch had a couple good runs as WWE tag team champs and one of them was rather lengthy.
this team did a lot of great stuff, although you probably missed a lot of it because it was an impact. But they do have the most days spent as the impact tag team champions between four different reigns, a total of 662 days. Some would argue that they could be listed higher, and you know, I could see that argument, I guess. See, this one's kind of a weird one, because Ivan won titles with a lot of different partners over the years, and there have been different incarnations of this. This, of course, is the most recent one that most fans remember, but I just kind of lumped Koloffs as kind of like a general thing and put it on this spot. Uh, you know, sue me. real life besties in the 90s these two teamed together off and on pretty much throughout that whole decade an awesome union even if it was just kind of two guys put together the star power of both of them was great and i think that they both kind of could hide each other's unbecomings if you will even if they weren't the most scientifically traditional tag team that you ever seen before They were literally an afterthought thrown together tag team. Somehow they found a way to make the team relevant, even if it was through comedy. We don't like heavy metal. We don't like rock and roll. All we like to listen to is Barry Madalo. French Canadian heroes and workhorses of the late 80s tag team scene. Sadly though, never held gold at a US promotion. This inclusion is kind of complicated. Technically, this is a whole stable of guys, but they did win the tag team title six times under three different incarnations. Mostly, this is remembered though as Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare as they were kind of the main team. Whether it was as the Samoan SWAT team in the NWA or as the head shrinkers in WWE, they were a very dangerous tag team and perhaps a tag team that was pretty much ahead of their time. Just think like a more brutal, primitive version of the Usos today. Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers, they were the ultimate journeyman tag team. In the 80s territory scene, they went absolutely everywhere. World class, Mid-South, CWA, UWF, All Japan, NWA, later on WCW. They even had a cup of coffee in the WWE uh, a few times actually. Absolute treasures of their time. Strike hard, strike first, strike force. Late 80s babyface tag team helped Martel get acclimated to things. Tito kind of took him under his wing during this time because Tito had already been around a minute. Then Martel would become the model and Tito would become the bullfighter. You know, could have done more had they stayed together longer. This team actually really gets forgotten about quite a bit by people, but they were an offset of the triple threat group with Shane Douglas. And during this time, this was possibly some of Candido's finest work and also helped Lance Storm become a name among the ECW crowd as well. Gallows was a WWE castaway. Anderson was an up and coming singles guy. And after they were paired together, they started really making some noise in Japan. Pretty sure this is the only team in the last decade or more, probably since the Road Warriors or the Dudleys, who have been the WWE tag team champions as well as New Japan's tag team champions. Two decorated, world-class workers never really got their big break in America. That being said, they did stuff on the lower-level promotions in the mid-90s, as well as a WWE run. Sadly, at that point, though, their best days were behind them as a team and so on. Kind of an obscure team, really. 
The mid-90s WCW Faces of Fear were a nice throwback to some of the hard-hitting tag teams of earlier in that decade, and literally I would say at least 90% of the business is still absolutely terrified of Ming. You can't talk about power tag teams without talking about the powers of pain, and Barbarian from the Faces of Fear was actually in this tag team with the Warlord. He pretty much did the same thing in both teams. A super team that everyone remembers fondly was even used as the centerpiece of Edge's return to wrestling back in the year 2020. Really many different versions of this team throughout the years. Active for over two decades though and in 2015 became members of the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. Very influential team even if they were before my time. Another team that I think was put together really is just a way to get a couple guys out of the way and they ended up succeeding far past beyond anybody's expectations at that time and even enjoyed a recent reincarnation. Still amazing that this team had success in two different decades, not something that a lot of teams can say. You know, you go back and watch some of these matches, I think they took years off of Ric Flair's career, even though he'd probably never admit it. They enjoyed a good run with the tag team titles, and let's face it, Batista pretty much learned everything along the way he would get. He would get the skills to become a main event performer just after this. It was a nice launching pad. You could really argue that they were the best heel tag team in the WWE throughout the whole decade of the 90s, especially the early 90s. I don't know if another team comes close besides Demolition. And this is more of like the mid, early mid 90s. This is like post Demolition era. Let me be specific. Remember, they're not the Mounties. Lance Storm is really just a consummate tag team wrestler. Some of his best work was right here with the Impact players, with Just Incredible. In ECW there, right around the end, they were definitely some of the most hated heels in the company at that time. <coughs> Starting as a team in Impact all those years ago, they did great things there and have went on to do great things in other places like Ring of Honor, etc. They've been together off and on throughout the years, but quite a lengthy tenure together if you add up all that time. This team very influential in a lot of ways in innovating this new hyper style of offense just like the Hardy Boys were a decade prior. Oh man, Bart and Billy. Billy's still in the business to this day, Bart, not so much. They had a nice long run as WWE Tag Team Champions as babyfaces before they turned heel and then they had yet another run with the belt. And while that scene was not exactly synonymous with great tag teams, they pretty much dominated the herd during that mid-90s section WWE. Perhaps the finest team to come through that NXT system, and that's saying quite a bit. And while they're currently split and their time was short, who knows what the future can hold, but the body of work, I think, speaks for itself. This team absolutely carried the torch for impact in the early days. James Storm still hanging around to this day. And it's funny, people thought that Chris Harris, I mean, Braden Walker or whatever you want to call him, everyone thought he was the star of the team, but Storm ended up having the better career, obviously. Harris was a great worker, but had the charisma of a vacuum, unfortunately.
I don't know why they were called that, you know, ask Vince Russo. So the team of Daniels, Elix Skipper, and Low Key. Most people remember them though as Elix Skipper and Christopher Daniels. That's that's the duo that had pretty much the most remarkable matches. Another team that innovated this style way ahead of its time and their influence can still be seen to this day. Had a memorable run there in the early 2000s, and they were the tag team champions there for a while as well in WWE. Pretty much died though when they led up to the big wedding, and then the whole shtick was a ruse, and, and it makes you wonder to this day what the point of it all was. I don't even think they knew. talented guys that could really move and were really a beacon of shining light in the WWE tag division in the late mid 2000s just wasn't really a whole lot of actually good teams during that time so they really stand out and fans still remember the guys to this day Brian Kendrick had a little mini comeback run a few years ago Paul London I don't think is ever going to get that chance for whatever reason Very rarely do you get a team that actually goes through a gimmick change, but that's what the APA basically did very slowly when they started as the Acolyte. They then just kind of slowly morphed into the APA. It became quite the entertaining long-running gag, one that they actually still kind of use to this day. Years prior to the APA, Ron Simmons was in a tag team with the Butch Reed known as Doom. They were briefly managed by a woman, aka Nancy Benoit. Fun fact, something I didn't know before researching this video. Before later, they were paired with Teddy Long, as you see here. Also, fun fact, Doom was the first official WCW tag team champions from the transition from the NWA to WCW officially. whole 10 year history for this team even though they worked together during that whole time talking about pretty much everywhere ring of honor pwg aw wwe nxt shikara new japan wherever there was tag team wrestling these guys were at Hey, they crossed a lot of boundaries in the 90s for better or for worse. The worser probably being their time in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. That's in contrast to their time in ECW. Did you know D'Lo Brown was one of the members while they were in Smoky Mountain Wrestling? I didn't know that. Let me know down in the comments section whether you knew that or not. Things were going good in ECW and then Mustafa left for whatever reason, left New Jack by himself. He actually probably became far more over as a solo act from that point. At first, this also seemed like kind of one of those thrown together tag teams, and it kind of took them a while to make everything work, but once it did, Beer Money became probably one of the most thought of Impact Wrestling tag teams over the years. The Impact Wrestling tag team champions a total of five times, and also are the longest reigning Impact tag team champions, and that's as a single reign and as combined reigns all together. So they're the top of the the king of the mountain if you will uh, as far as impact wrestling tag teams go They started as a team in Ring of Honor, and they did that for about three or four years, and most thought the WWE was going to come calling, and I think they almost even actually went, but then they didn't end up going for whatever reason. They ended up going to Impact Wrestling instead. They were treated very well there, but of course on a very much lower profile, but they still did some amazing great things while they were there and beyond. Apparently are both active and still wrestling matches together as of here in 2023 so there you go
They were originally known as Too Much. Taylor was kind of thought of as a job guy. Brian Christopher, of course, was, well, wrestling royalty. Eventually, they transformed into Grandmaster Sexay and Scotty Too Hotty and became Too Cool. And once Rikishi started dancing with them, it was all over. They were probably the most over tag team in WWE during 2000, maybe the year or so after. Uh, hot as lightning for a point. They cut their teeth in the AWA and FCW, went into NWA, WCW there for a bit before going to WWE, then back into WCW, but they were your synonymous, typical brawler, heel tag team. They even had a little baby face run there for a minute in the late 90s. SAG's career was cut a little short. Knobs though, worked for many years after that. Eventually, SAG's was able to come back to wrestling and they did some indie spots before they got a match on SmackDown in 2007. They were just signed for a day and then released depending on who you ask. Throw back to the time when tag teams were just as simple as throwing together your two biggest stars. That's what happened here and it was of course awesome. Hogan and Savage took the team all the way, which made the downfall all the much better, which led into their WrestleMania 5 clash. Speaking of power teams, I remember this one quite fondly. WWE was kind of coming out of the time during the new generation era where everything was hokey, and they were kind of the transitional team for that time. A couple of solid guys that they put together, and of course they had that family relationship there as well. Just playing out more of that heart family drama, which we got a lot of in the 90s. But they were a very nice break from teams like Smoking Guns, and men on a mission, etc. I guess they were kind of supposed to be like the tag team version of Hulk Hogan, but I don't see it. But definitely the beginning of two great careers and two that are intertwined forever to this day as their families kind of morphed into each other and created this one huge wrestling super family. That's just basically the quickest way to explain it. And they were champions during the first ever WrestleMania, so that gets points for me. really innovators in so many ways. They made so much noise in ECW that they had to be scooped up by WCW in late 1995. They even went on to become tag team champions there. Sadly though, it's a sad story as we lost both guys at early ages and we don't even get to see them anywhere, not even on the convention scene or anything like that, which I guess maybe they're lucky that they don't have to see the 50th ECW reunion. Diner went to Michigan, Rotunda went to Syracuse, Sullivan went to Satan University. They were the Varsity Club. This is a well-remembered team from the last couple years of the 80s in NWA, and they were even brought back for a faint moment during the Russo era of WCW in the late 90s. These guys are kind of like the kiss of tag team wrestling. They've went through many different incarnations over the years. There's of course the most famous one with Luke and Butch as the Bushwhackers slash Sheep Herders. But gosh, nearly a 40 year history for these guys as a tag team. Definitely an impressive body of work. Probably most notable for their long tenure as AWA Tag Team Champions. Very ahead of their time with their very menacing heel ways. Really left a handbook for tag team wrestlers to follow and singles wrestlers to follow for years to come. Baker and Kane, you know, it's simple enough, but sometimes you just kind of put the two guys together. 
couple of huge dudes just kind of kicking A and taking names. And even though, you know, on and off again, convoluted reunions and so on, I bet you ask just your casual fan to name a tag team. A lot of them might even come up with Taker and Kane, the Brothers of Destruction. Right, blonde hair, old school heels, whether it was Johnny and Jimmy or Johnny and Jerry. The duos were successful, held gold wherever they went, and made their babyface counterparts look like a million bucks. What else do you need to say? Larry Hitting, Harley Race, they dominated the scene in the AWA before later on doing some of probably their more famous work over in Japan. They then came back to the AWA to rule again. Devastating duo, heck of a pedigree when you think about what they actually went on to accomplish in later years, especially Harley Race. Real life brothers Mark and Jay started wrestling before they were even 18 years old. And for over 20 years, they have honed their craft on pretty much every stage imaginable all across the world. There's been rumblings of interest from WWE over the years, but nothing's ever really panned out. In 2009, they had an official tryout there, but of course that was very early on in their career. Still, I think their resume pretty much speaks for itself. Watch a Briscoe's match. Of course, they weren't a team for very long, but if you haven't gotten the point by now, I myself am just a sucker for the super teams. When it makes sense, it's just absolutely great. May I suggest, may I offer you some Heatwave 98, RVD and Sabu vs. Jinzei Shinzaki and Hayabusa. DiBiase and Rotunda spent their post primes together as Money Incorporated, the stalwart heel tag team of the early 90s, and had some nice run as WWE tag team champions during that time. Need I say more? Pentagon and Phoenix, arguably the most exciting tag team in the game in current day here in 2023. The ceiling is still quite high for them given what they've accomplished already. The more high profile that All Elite Wrestling gets, the higher their profiles will become. Who knows what the future will hold. best friends, on and off tag team partners for 20 years now, whether it was back in the day as Kevin Steen and El Generico or current day as Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. You gotta give credit where credit is due as far as their work together as a team throughout the years, throughout various promotions in different forms, albeit in different decades. A soul patrol, if you will, this duo broke many barriers for WWE back in the 1980s and are looked at as a pretty influential pair of guys that parlayed some success into some tag team stuff. Long time champions in their own right, their influence shows through to this day. Every few years, it seems like in comes a hot shot tag team doing all this fancy stuff. At one point, that team was Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood. Steamboat went on to great things, Youngblood, not so much. I mean, come on, just with names like Crusher and Bruiser, that, those names, they just epitomize what wrestling is all about. They pretty much held stock as AWA Tag Team Champions for quite a while. That's pretty much the story there. Well, if you remember what I said about Steamboat and Youngblood and about Hot Shot tag teams, Ganya and Brunzel were Ganya and Brunzel were basically the AWA version of that. I mean, with a name like the High Flyers, I mean, come on, innovative for their time, and I think that's why they kind of edge out just slightly higher in this list here. 
My personal favorite tag team of all time right there. When I saw what these guys were doing, it completely changed the ball game for me and made me look at tag team wrestling in a whole new light. Me personally, it's a shame that they didn't really get a chance to do their thing on a major stage. The actual lifespan of the team was short. Perry Saturn went on to WCW and had a decent singles career. John Cronus, not so much. Together, they were awesome. Man, I just wish they would have had a better run. Rest in peace, John Cronus. I mean, what can you say about these guys that hasn't been said a million times already? Absolutely revolutionary. They pumped lifeblood into a stale WCW tag team division, and that made every other team in the company a babyface against them. Not only just a babyface, but the hottest babyface at that time. Just whoever was challenging them. I don't think they get enough credit for the work that they actually did during that time. It was literally them versus everybody. Another one of those teams where really the story, a lot of the story may have yet to be written. A lot of potential ceiling. This all may change with time and perspective, but I think as we stand right here, right now, in the year of 2023, this is a nice spot for them. They've accomplished so much and are arguably the best current tag team out there. You can make the argument. Only time will tell. greatest tag team they were known as and that's quite a name to live up to they were put together in the wwe developmental cycles and saw themselves all the way through to the wwe main roster and were crowned pretty much one of the best teams in that division during that time shelton benjamin was then given a singles push then that singles push hath get taken away they resurfaced years later in ring of honor and shelton benjamin's back in wwe now haas pretty much much done. Gotta have love for Harlem Heat, Booker T, Stevie Ray. You know, when they first came in, they were known as Cole and Kane. It's gotta be Kane! I mean, several time WCW Tag Team Champions, really the stalwart team of the whole 90s in that promotion. Booker T got to go on to be a big single star. Stevie Ray, not so much. As you can see, that's usually a theme with teams. One of them becomes a star, one of them doesn't for whatever reason. Why why do you think that is? Let me know down in the comments. An evil foreigner gimmick? Perhaps nobody did it better than Fuji and Tanaka. Times and racial tensions being what they were. They were a perfect team for that time. Either way, they were impressive for that time and basically left a blueprint for that gimmick. You know, there's a whole other subsection of people where I bet if you ask them to name any tag team, this is going to be one of the tag teams that is named. The most over tag team in the business during the time where the business was most over, broke the most records, not exactly made the most money on the whole because technically they make more money now, but you get the picture. The ratings were bigger, the crowds were bigger, and you know, you know the old saying, a million people can't be wrong, and they were even still semi-active all the way up until a few years years ago. Perhaps the greatest odd couple tag team of all time right here. I mean, it was different in the way usually when you have a couple of team members that don't really see eye to eye and they're not on the same page. It's leading to a breakup and a feud with each other. Rock and Sock Connection was very unique as that was the whole dynamic of the team. And surprisingly enough, I don't think wrestling has done a good enough job at copying this formula since then, where you literally have have two partners who really don't care for each other and it's not necessarily leading to a breakup but you just kind of see them be oil and vinegar every week and there's nothing wrong with that and it can be very very entertaining wwe kind of did that with team hell no back in like 2012 or something like that but you don't really see it that often i wonder why 
Not gonna pretend like they weren't totally before my time, but this is another one of those super teams. As individuals, they have great resumes, you put them together, they also have a great resume when they were a team. In fact, they were the quintessential heel tag team for Vern Gagne's AWA. They feuded with pretty much everybody under the sun. This pairing just doesn't get talked about enough, quite frankly. Ric Flair's singles career trumps anything really that they ever did, but they were amazing as a team, and it's just, man. They teamed mostly from 77 to 79, but they did work together all the way as late as 1982. Altogether, three reigns with the NWA tag team titles, and over 200 days total spent with the titles. Although they were only active from 02 to 04, they spent 114 days as WWE Tag Team Champions. Their work as a team really helped to launch Eddie into a singles career where he would become a main eventer shortly after that. You have to think if Eddie would have lived past 2005, we would have revisited this team several times over the last 20 years. I mean, it really speaks for itself. Over 20 year body of work, titles won everywhere you could possibly imagine. You can't deny their accomplishments. You can't deny the fact that they've lived their whole lives basically working in this business for nearly 20 years now. And once again, a lot of the story is left to be written. Time will tell, but an impressive body of work nonetheless. I think they deserve this spot possibly even higher, but this is where they land for now. They love to wrestle, they love to party. Marty apparently loved to party just a little bit too much, which if you think back on it, and he partied harder than Shawn Michaels, I mean, you could just imagine. <coughs> there'd be no Hardy Boys, and then if there was no Hardy Boys, there'd be no Young Bucks, etc. None of that happens without the Rockers. Yes, other teams were doing the high flying type of stuff, but they put it together with the flashiness of the outfits, and etc., etc. It's a a package that'll probably work as long as time and as long as there's wrestling. couple of guys that aren't actually brothers but are about as close as you could get to a pair of brothers that spent their whole careers together basically from the indies all the way to the late 90s early 2000s WWE they split apart for years but came back together they have both went on to pretty dang good singles careers Edge of course a little bit higher echelon than Christian but Christian uh, not too shabby of a singles career himself you put him together they're still awesome. What else can you say? The number 20 tag team of all time here. I mean, just look at them. You know how many 70s kids probably had nightmares about these guys? They gave me nightmares even years later. Afonsica held 21 championships during their time as a tag team. WWE, NWA, pretty much everywhere you can think of, all across continent and globes. The cornerstones of the Samoan dynasty that we all talk about, WWE loves to talk about very fondly to this day, that Roman Reigns is the current king of. <laughs> yes. Who doesn't love Terry Funk? The team with him and his brother Dory Funk Jr. was active technically all the way from 1966 up until 2005, even though a lot of those years they weren't technically active. But hey, they technically never broke up either. Hell, they'd probably wrestle to this day if you asked them. I really don't know how they got all the way up into this spot, quite honestly, now that we're doing this list. <laughs> but somehow they made it in the top 20. Um, you know, over the top, pretty boy gimmick. They were really successful all over the territory system. Stan Lee, but then split to be a part of the Midnight Express. Kern floundered around for a few years and then he became Skinner. And by the mid 90s, both guys were formally retired from in-ring action. A 
couple guys that were stuck in WCW mid-card hell there in the mid-90s. They were thrown together as a team and just kind of forgotten about. Well, Austin and Pillman, they had other plans for themselves. They developed the Hollywood Blondes characters, started to really make the most out of being a team. They worked their tails off and then they ascended in the card. They even flirted with the main event picture there for a while. Ultimately, of course, Austin would go on to revolutionize the business and Pillman did so as well in his own way. odd history of the kayfabe anderson name so hear me out okay gene and lars started it lars retires he brings in a guy named alan they rename him Oli. they make Oli Oli anderson gene then retires in 81 but then in 1985 Oli reforms the team with arn anderson who wasn't even an actual anderson as well either uh, does everyone follow me there started off as just kind of a joke in ECW. These two guys parlayed that into such a huge, successful tag team wrestling career. Have really went everywhere and done everything. Have won gold everywhere from Japan, WWE, ECW. Now, technically they were the WCW tag team champions, but that was of course during the invasion, so it's kind of like a participation trophy, but they claim that as some sort of huge thing. Uh, Impact, you name it, been everywhere, done anything, couple of bad A's in their own right. They even had a farewell tour in WWE a few years back. Who knows what the future may hold. I think their chapters are pretty much written, but they settle in right here, just outside the top 10. I thought was a very nice spot for the Dudley boys. Arn Anderson, fresh off the experience of teaming with Ole, then started teaming with Tully Blanchard. And this, of course, while the two were a part of the Four Horsemen. When they left to WWE, they were named the Brain Busters and were managed by Bobby Heenan. Things were going awesome until a surprise drug test later. Tully found himself excommunicated from the business. Arn would slowly go back to WCW. And even to this day, I would argue that Tully Blanchard is looked at as kind of a stigmatizing figure in the business for whatever reason. Another team that just started as kind of a thrown together thing that, you know, WWE just kind of gave for these guys to do and they took it and they ran with it. They came up with these concepts, with catchphrases, outfit ideas, you name it, and they made it their own. And I mean, gosh, we're going on close to a decade now we've had of the New Day being a tag team or a trio or what have you in WWE. So, and of course up there as far as as total reigns, as tag team champions, as well as combined days, long reigns, etc., etc. They definitely deserve a spot right here. You know, a lot of people will say the Demolition were just a clone of the Road Warriors, and be that as it may, I like to look at it as kind of like a Coke and Pepsi type thing. You know, Coca-Cola was the Road Warriors, and here comes the WWE Pepsi's version of Demolition. And you can have a world with both. Held the record for the longest reign for a number of years, of course, until the New Day, and then the Usos more recently broke it and took it from them. Either way, here comes comes the axe, here comes the smasher, the demolition, walk-in disaster. Granted, they weren't a team for very long, not very decorated as far as title wins and stuff like that goes, but I tell you what, I dare say that no team was more influential than these guys, especially the Dynamite Kid, who inspired a whole generation of wrestlers later on through the 90s, etc., etc. You just go back and look at their work and how can you not say top 10? 
what, like 15 years as a team on the biggest stage of wrestling in the whole country. Numerous title reigns, including record-breaking ones. I don't really know what else I could say. They definitely deserve their spot here. There also is a lot more of the story to be written, so who knows? Maybe that number one spot will be theirs someday. This wrestling family, you could kind of technically say more of a stable than your traditional tag team. And there would be different variations of teams with, you know, throughout the family or kayfabe family throughout the years. Kevin and David teamed as well as Kevin and Carrie. The Von Erich legacy and mystique is such that no one can question what kind of influence that they had. The Achilles heel of the Von Eriks, if you will, for so many years. The longtime dancing partners of the Von Eriks, their successes and their influences pretty much go hand in hand. That's why we thought that they had to be neck and neck basically on this list. Michael Hayes carried the Freebird name on into Michael Hayes carried the Freebird name onto later years in WCW with Jimmy Jam Garvin as his partner. So I guess just because they lasted a little longer, quite frankly, because they were heels just a little bit cooler, they edge out the Von Erics by just a little bit. They were a team from 1985 to 1991. Two lengthy WWE tag team title runs on their resume. Their influence is great. They actually innovated a lot of tag team maneuvers, or at least was the first time that we had seen them on major national TV. Bret Hart would go on to great singles career. Once again, Jim Neidhart, not so much. The reasons for that one are varied. I think mainly because he held out for that contract while they were tag Tag team champions. Don't you know Vince McMahon never forgets. I don't know that any team took themselves more seriously and more were committed to the art of tag team wrestling than the Midnight Express. From 83 to 87, it was Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry. Then Stan Lane took over from there and they were a team all the way until the year of 1990. Stan Lane's career was cut kind of short. Bobby Eaton remained a utility and tag team wrestler all the way through the 90s. They had the work. They had the psychology, and they had the mic, arguably the greatest promo of the 1980s, Jim Cornette himself. Really an inspiration to backyard wrestlers everywhere. These two guys went from a trampoline all the way to the grandest stage, biggest crowds of WrestleMania, performing the hugest daredevil spots, especially Jeff Hardy. They were in the right place, right time, started working WWE shows as jobbers, and actually worked their way up from there, which is also a very rare entrance, which is also very rare because usually when you're an enhancement talent, you're pretty much an enhancement talent for life, but they were young enough that they were eventually brought in as a part of the WWE main roster. This was the 1998 Attitude Era, and the rest, of course, from there is history. Held many titles in WWE and so on, basically all across the country even after that. They'll remain technically an active team to this day in 2023, despite of Jeff Hardy's recent problems. Call them the Road Warriors, call them the Legion of Doom, call them whatever you want to call them. No one can doubt the influence and legacy that they left behind. Technically not the most proficient wrestlers in the world, just a lot of beating up and a lot of power moves. But the power, the spikes, the paint, it was all just the right package at the right time. And I mean, back in the 80s, guys would come in that were trying to get into this business and they would be fed to these guys. It would be absolutely terrible. Terrifying. You go back and watch some of those Crockett shows where they're just tearing dudes apart. They kicked A everywhere from Crockett to WWE to Japan, everywhere there and back, winning titles everywhere virtually. Technically, you can say the team ran from 83 to 2003. That's an impressive 20 year reign. Of course, Hawk sadly dying in 2003 put everything to a halt for the team. Animal tried to resurrect it with Heidenreich but we would rather forget about all that. 
pretty much everything I just said about the Road Warriors, you can go ahead and double that for the Steiner brothers. Very influential, and while technically they were a power team like the Road Warriors, they were also very innovative as well. Scott Steiner doing the Frankensteiner, which is something that we had never seen in our country up until that time, and really had two impressive runs. You know, early 90s was very strong in NWA and then into WCW, and then they had a nice little WWE run came back to WCW and they were always strong but they were pretty much the top babyface tag team to oppose the NWO that is until Scott joined it anyway and even though they were probably at their best while they were just destroying guys they could also get down and dirty and have a nice good match as well At the end of the day, really the only obvious choice there is for a number one to a list like this. The argument being is no one's done a better or longer. Uh, a team that's still active to this day, literally 40 years of being a tag team these guys have been. Formula, very simple. Ricky gets beat up, Robert comes in like a house of fire and kicks A, and then whatever happens after that happens. We go to the finish sometime after that. It's tried. And and true they perfected it along the way they're worshipped as gods in some part of this country for crying out loud that's it that's the argument no one has done it better or longer than the rock and roll express that's it folks that's the list you know of course wrestling is subjective it means something different to everyone my list or our list may be different from your list or the guy down the streets list either way a collection of 100 tag teams not easy to name to even name 100 tag teams quite honestly getting this list together was truly a labor of love i appreciate you for sticking around and watching it on your way out definitely please consider subscribing to the channel and leave a like on this video that helps the channel no matter what make sure you check out pwplanet.com to see how you can keep in touch with me on there we'll see you next time right here on pro wrestling planet